Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Kompasa. Today I'm going to talk about uh, Ukraine's defense minister. Uh, he's going to be removed from his post. And Brazil and Argentina preparing a new Latin American currency. So uh, I'm going to start with the Guardian article regarding the, the uh, movement or the resignation. Not resignation, he's just going to be moved to another post, but... Uh, this is the Ukrainian defense minister. So, head of president's parliamentary bloc seems to confirm reshuffle of Oleksiy Reznikov as Russians close in on Bakhmut. Ukraine's defense minister, under pressure from a corruption scandal, is to be reshuffled into another government job as Russian forces close in on Bakhmut amid heavy fighting, a close ally of President Vladimir Zelensky has announced. Um, Keep in mind, people, I think that, that, that uh, these uh, purges regarding corruption is baloney. I think it's quite hilarious. I mean, Ukraine has always been a very corrupt country. Um, I think that the uh, they know that the ship is sinking. Uh, you know, the Aristovich, you know, came out and said, we're not going to win this war. Um, the the Ukrainians, I think Vladimir Zelensky himself said that if I don't get enough equipment, I am doomed by August or, I'm you know, it's going to be over by August. I assume he means over for Ukraine. I, you know, that's what we have to think, right? Um, so a lot of these people in Kiev, they know that they are in deep trouble uh, as we're speaking. Uh, okay, but the position of Oleksiy Reznikov, one of Ukraine's better known figures internationally, has been under threat after it emerged. The defense ministry paid twice or three times the supermarket price of food to supply troops on the front line. On Sunday night, David uh, Arachmia, chief of Zelensky's servant of the People Parliamentary Bloc, said the defense ministry would be headed up by uh, Kirailo Budanov, head of the Ukraine's military intelligence. Rez uh, in military intelligence, Reznikov, he added, would become Minister of Strategic Industries tasked with strengthening military industrial uh, cooperation after a day of speculation about the defense minister's future in Kiev. War dictates changes in uh, personal policy. Arachmia said on his Telegram channel, times and circumstances require strengthening and regrouping. This is what is happening now and it will happen in the future. Ukraine doesn't have a future uh, anymore. Uh, the, the country of Ukraine, as we know, uh, is going to get chopped up and destroyed. And that is the sad consequence uh, of this. But it's also, to a certain extent, the fault of the Ukrainians because they allowed themselves to be pawns of um, of, um, of NATO and uh, the West to antagonize against Russia. So, and once again, this was admitted again by uh, Angela Merkel and... Um, Hollande, François Hollande, and Poroshenko. Uh, and guess what? The neocons and the liberal European Union and all these people, none of them cared about Ukraine. They don't care about Ukraine. They want to fight. They want Ukraine to fight to the last Ukrainian against Russia. Some sad shit. After, after Akramia's statement, there was no immediate comment from Reznikov, but earlier he had given a press conference in which he suggested, suggested that his tenure as a defense minister may not last much longer. No one is in the chair for his whole life, Reznikov said, had said earlier on Sunday amid speculation. Um, that he would be forced to resign or be reshuffled, and stressed that his position as defense minister was up to President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine in accordance with the Constitution. 
The minister also highlighted the weapons that Ukraine has gradually obtained from the West over the past year. From 155 military artillery to tanks and argued that therefore we can say today we are a, a de facto NATO country. And this is how Russia has been seen, seeing the Ukrainian military. That Ukraine, although not officially a NATO member, it's still a de facto NATO army. Uh, Russia has destroyed multiple Ukrainian armies. First, it was the original NATO army. Uh, then it was the NATO army. And then you have a bunch of conscripts and, and so forth. Well, it's I think technically they're still fighting a NATO army because there's still a lot of mercenaries in um, in Ukraine. And a lot of those mercenaries are uh, NATO, former NATO soldiers who probably handed in their resignation. I mean, if you look at some of the videos, you can hear a strong Midwestern American accents. Uh, there's a lot of Georgians and, and Polish people uh, on the radio waves, Belarusians, who are obviously opposed to Russia as well as uh, President Lukashenko in Belarus. So, yeah, there you go. Um, last week, the Ukrainian minister met the French president Emmanuel Macron in Paris, in, in, in Paris which had appeared to underline his uh, sen seniority in. Kiev's government. But Reznikov faced a string of questions about corruption in, in the ministry from Ukrainian journalists. At a time when Zelensky had instituted a fresh anti-corruption drive to show the country can be uh, ready for EU membership uh, efforts uh, to tackle corruption in, the, in his ministry needed to be fully reloaded, he admitted. The defense minister said he believed that Ukraine <coughs> would eventually obtain F-16s or other Western uh, fighter jets, but warned against slow decision-making. Procrastination with aircraft platforms, Reznikov said, will cost us more lives and blood of Ukrainians and will cost the West more in, in post-war reconstruction. Uh, Mr. Reznikov, the F-16s will be shot down, <laughs> okay? Uh, Russia has the most, if or one of the most, uh, sophisticated anti-aircraft missile systems. Um, you know, the S-400s, S-500s, uh, and so forth. They're, they're very advanced. Uh, so, and plus, as we've spoken about it before, the many months it will take to train a lot of these Ukrainian soldiers and pilots into handling all this Western equipment. A future Russian offensive, the minister predicted, would come from two, two directions of their priority. To try and break through our defense, defense line in the east and south in an attempt to capture all the eastern Donbass and maintain a large land bridge between pre-war Russia and Crimea, occupied since 2014. The big attack would probably be probably be time to coincide with the first anniversary of the war, said Reznikov, adding that while not all of the Western weaponry will arrive in time, he believed Ukraine would be uh, would be able to hold back a fresh assault. Russia has gradually stepped up its attack on the western on the eastern city of Bakhmut, where the offense is led by the private military Wagner Group, although the Ukrainians argue that Moscow was uh, continuing to take heavy losses, mostly of prisoners allowed out of jails and forced into battle. Uh, we've spoken about the Wagner Group before. Uh, as far as I understood it, they're not really forced into battle. They're given a choice. You, you can basically rot in jail uh, or you can... Uh, fight your way out of freedom in the Wagner group uh, and recruiting uh, criminals or former criminals uh, oh, is not uh, something that is uncommon 
necessarily. We, you know, the French Foreign Legion does this. There's plenty of people with some form of uh, criminal record, or low, there are like uh, limits to what you have done in your past, right? You can't be like a child molester or a rapist or something crazy like that, right? But I think I'm not sure about the how violent the crimes are, basically. Um, yeah, obviously not terrorism. But anyway, let's go on. Russia, Reznikov said, was losing 500 killed and wounded every day in Bakhmut. Now they're projecting. It's probably it's uh, the other way around. A figure that is not possible to verify. Verify while Ukraine's losses were strictly less <laughs> in fierce winter fighting that has gradually seen Moscow's forces come closer to enveloping the largely deserted city. In fact, von der Leyen, Ursula von der Crazy. She, it, it slipped out of her mouth, actually. See, she said that over 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed. And yeah, now they had to cut that video piece out from her speech, but, you know, the Western leaders know that, that this, is, this is not going their way. Um, both Russia, as well as the West, to a certain extent, underestimated each other, okay? Russia underestimated the capabilities of the Ukrainian army. They went in very soft. They expected a lot of public support. Uh, in, in some areas, they did get a lot of public support, uh, but they, they didn't go hard enough in some places. In fact, uh, Russian soldiers uh, <clears throat> went above all to sort of above and beyond to not try to minimize the, the, the civilian casualties. That's why, for instance, the uh, uh, the, uh, the this, in, in the in the fierce urban fightings in Mariupol, uh, you, you there's a lot of like it was extremely fierce. You know, it's almost like a Stalingrad situation, right? So yeah, but the Russians have stepped up. They have enforced their defense lines. Um, they have mobilized more troops. Uh, in fact, it is said that they have mobilized actually 500,000 troops. But a lot of some people speculate that this, we don't know for sure, obviously, but they speculate that these, all these 500,000, they're going to be some sort of occupation army. Uh, if, they, if the Russians intend to occupy all of Ukraine, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think that Russia will probably have to do it uh, because if they, if they give a rump state, let's say they give Kiev and I, I don't think they're going to give Kiev though, but let's say they give, give Kiev and the whole Galician, uh, parts of Galicia to, to Poland and, and, and the West, well, they can just prepare a new army and cause all this headache again. So, the western parts of Ukraine, in my opinion, it is going to be a tough nut to crack unless uh, if Poland takes Galicia, uh, sure, uh, they can occupy it and even integrate it into Poland. But the problem is a lot of Ukrainian nationalists, they don't like Polish people, right? Uh, and Galicia is the hotbed center of, uh, you know, band right neo-Nazi activity in Ukraine. Uh, and a lot of people speculate that this will be Poland's Vietnam. There's always going to be some sort of, you know, uh, maybe some uh, small intense guerrilla insurgency there, right? They might start some bombing campaigns similar to the IRA or the ETA in Spain and the IRA in England, where they uh, conducted these bombing attacks in both you know in England and Spain and so forth. Uh, maybe that's what's going to happen to Poland. Uh, so instead of redirecting their uh, attention to uh, to Russia, these nationalists are going to start attacking Polish targets. Uh, could be a possibility. 
you never know. They're very unpredictable people. So, but yeah, the casualty figure is likely to be on the high side, but reflective of the of the nature of urban warfare and a con contest for a city which has dragged on for several months, but is increasingly entering its end game. Britain's Ministry of Defense said Bakhmut was increasingly isolated in a morning intelligence assessment, which noted that Russia now had the two main roads in the city under threat from direct artillery fire, making it harder to supply the defending forces into the town. Yes, isolated is just another word that they use. What they mean is Bakhmut is pretty much encircled. I think the Russians left some roads purposely uh, free so, so the Ukrainian army can pretty much leave the place uh, to retreat or run away. Uh, because if you read, for instance, Sun Tzu's Art of War, they say if you close off the, uh, the, the route of escape and retreat, your soldiers will fight like never before. Um, yeah, there is a possibility that's why they do, these, uh, do this. But I also believe that they also allow some roads to be open because uh, effectively it's, it's demilitarizing Ukraine, right? You, you are grinding down the Ukrainian army when the Ukrainian government and army is just pouring in reservists and, and conscripts into, into, into Bakhmut. Uh, and this is like you're feeding, uh, you know, fresh meat to the Russian artillery uh, barrages, right? So, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Um, Yegevne Prigozhin, the head of Wagner, said Ukrainian forces were continuing to contest the Russian advance in a statement that described Bakhmut by its old name, which dates back to the Soviet era. In northern, uh, <clears throat> sorry, in the northern uh, qu quarters of Artemyos, Artemovsk, Artyomovsk should be said. Fierce battles are going on for every street, every house, every stairwell, Prigozhin said. The Ukrainian armed forces are fighting to the last. Absolutely. Uh, Zelensky himself acknowledged the pressure Ukraine, Ukraine's defenders were under in, under in the east. It's very difficult in the Donetsk region. There are fierce battles, but no matter how hard it is and no matter how much pressure there is, we have to withstand it, he said. I think this is extremely uh, sad and very, very cruel, to be honest with you. And, you know, especially when they had exposed that a lot of these Ukrainian ministers that were purged, I think one of them went to Spain, to Spain uh, during, the, during this difficult time that Ukraine is facing. He is going to Spain on vacation. <clears throat> I find that uh, very distasteful, to say the least, right? Uh, it's easy for Zelensky to sit here and say we have to withstand it and stuff like that when he is allegedly in his bunker in Kiev or whatever. Uh, some people speculate that he is not even in Ukraine. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, they, they, it's these fanatics that, uh, that surrounds... Uh, Zelensky and um, yeah, they are they they are willing to fight to the last man. You know what I mean? Instead of doing a tactical retreat, but they also know if they do a, a retreat, this will give control uh, to the Russians. You know the whole main supply line of of Donbas, right? Because the Bakhmut, the city of Bakhmut, is a linchpin for that. Um, so let's continue. Any decision to stage a tactical retreat from Bakhmut, Re Reznikov said, would be made by Ukraine's military leaders, led by G uh, General Valery Zeluzhny, arguing it was not a matter that could be determined by politicians. Five civilians were killed by Russian shelling, regional officials said, four of whom were in the eastern Donetsk province, um, including three in Bakhmut. <sighs> Five were injured, injured in Kharkiv when missiles struck a residential building and a university block. <clears throat> well, there you go. 
that's um, that's the anti-corruption purge for you. And now I want to go over to Latin America. Uh, Brazil and Argentina are doing some very interesting things. They're trying to reduce their reliance on U.S. dollar. And this is a article written by Ben Norton, an excellent journalist. Uh, and a geopolitical analyst. Uh, this is on the website called geopoliticaleconomy.com. So it says here, Brazil and Argentina are making plans for a Latin American currency called the Sur to boast regional trade and reduce reliance on the U.S. dollar. Lula had pledged it would it what had pledged it while running for president. Excellent initiative. The governments of Brazil and, and Argentina are making plans to create a new currency for Latin America called the Sur, South in English. According to a report in the Financial Times, other countries in the region will be invited to use the currency. Their goal is to boost regional trade and reduce reliance uh, on the US dollar. While the new newspaper uh, noted, citing government officials, Argentina's economic minister Sergio Massa told Financial Times that the South American nations will soon start studying the param parameters needed for the common currency, while it, wa which includes everything from fiscal issues to the size of the economy and the role of the central banks. Massa said they are preparing a study of mechanisms for trade integration, but he cautioned that it would take years to develop. And this is, this is just the first step on a long road which Latin America must travel. Brazil and Argentina will uh, discuss the currency plans at the meeting of the community of Latin America and Caribbean states in Buenos Aires on January 24th. Brazil has the largest economy in Latin America and Argentina has the third biggest after Mexico. Uh, Ar Argentina-based Spanish economist Alfredo Soreno, Seren, Seren, Serrano Monk, who directs the, uh, directs the think tank dedicated to regional integration, uh, the Latin American Strategic Center of Geopolitics, CELAG, told the Financial Times that the path is to find mechanisms which substitute the dependence on uh, the dollar. He added that now is the moment, given that there are many governments that are ideologically similar, which with left wing leaders across Latin America, he is absolutely correct. And I think that Latin leftist governments in, in Latin America, they have to be more authoritarian uh, to a certain extent as well, because the problem with Latin America is we have a common pattern where a lot of these progressive revolutionary governments tend to be overthrown every 10th, five, every 5th, 10th, or 15th, or 20th year by a right-wing fascist junta, or they are being uh, tossed out of the building. Um, you know, if you want to consolidate power, and it, this might sound crazy when I say this, but if you're going to consolidate power, you have to create... Uh, some form of paramilitary, similar to what the uh, Iranians did in the Islamic Revolution, or maybe what the Bolsheviks did in Russia, uh, the Soviet Union with the Red Army. And that is because a lot of these Latin American true militaries cannot be trusted. Uh, you know, they are very pro-American. The middle class in Latin America is extremely reactionary. They are also very pro-American. Uh, they're very capitalistic in their mindset. They don't believe in sharing resources. Um, and that's why, for instance, fascists in Latin America uh, work hand in hand with neoliberal uh, economists uh, from the Chicago School. Uh, because the fascists, uh, first of all, a lot of them come from the middle class in, in Latin America. They are not... They don't see fascism as a threat to capital. It's not going to, you know, uh, destroy the privileges of, this, of these middle class people or upper class people in uh, in Latin America. It, it's going to maintain the status quo where what ninety percent of the uh, wealth goes to ten to five percent of the population. Um, 
So yeah. So here we go. But obviously fascism in in different countries and contexts varies. So not all fascism is necessarily in the same way in in uh, in Latin America as, as it was in necessarily in Italy or in Spain or whatever, you know, they have sometimes different uh, ways of operating. You know, some fascists may be more social democratic in their economic policies, but specifically to Latin America, they all often implement the uh, neoliberal, um, you know, free market mayhem that we saw, for instance, in Chile with uh, the coup d'etat carried out by Pinochet. Uh, so let's continue. Brazil's left leftist president Lula da Silva returned to power on January 1st. During his electoral campaign, Lula had floated the possibility of creating a regional currency for trade. At a rally in May 2022, the Workers' Party leader had said, we are going to create a currency in Latin America because we can't keep depending on the dollar. That's perfect, right? Um, if you keep relying on the dollar because of its uh, world currency, right? And, you know, the IMF controls a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the loans and stuff. So when you sanction a country, I mean, you can't really trade its, its, uh, its commodities as easy because the world currency is dollar, right? So that's gonna be a problem. Uh, but more and more countries are willing to diversify their uh, currency portfolio, so to speak. Even Saudi Arabia, which is a close US ally, has uh, gotten tired of the uh, dic dictates from Washington. Uh, Lula revealed that it would be called the Sur. He added that it would not be based on the Euro model, in that countries could maintain their sovereign domestic currency. Instead, the plan would be used to sue for regional trade, Lula said. Uh, after Lula won the October 2022 election, Ecuador's left-wing politician and economist Andres uh, Arauz, Arauz published a blueprint for a new regional financial architect architecture for Latin America. Arauz said the plan would be to revive regional institutions like the Union of South American Nations, UNA Sur, and the Bank del Sur Bank of the South, and to create a, a Banco Central del Sur, Central Bank of the South, to oversee the new currency. The goal is to harmonize the payment system of the countries that make up UNASUR in order to carry out uh, interbank transfers to any bank inside of the region in real time and, and from a cell phone, he wrote. Arauz was a presidential candidate who came close to winning Ecuador's uh, 2021 election. He is also finishing a PhD in economics. Okay, Argentina has suffered with odious debt owed to foreign colonial powers for 200 years. Today, Argentina is trapped in 44 billion of debt with the US dominated International Monetary Fund, IMF. This dollar denominated foreign debt has led to a constant drain of foreign currency out of Argentina, fueling high levels of inflation. Argentina's President Alberto Fernandez visited China and Russia in February 2022, seeking alternatives to the U.S.-dominated financial system and joining Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative. Argentina has also applied to join the extended BRICS uh, plus bloc with Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Buenos Aires attended the group's 2022 summit at Beijing's invitation as former President Lula was himself a co-founder of the BRICS. Uh, both uh, Brazil and Argentina are already part of South American trade bloc known as uh, Mercosur, Mercado Común del Sur, or Common Market of the South. Lula has for years emphasized the importance of economic and political integration of Latin America and the Caribbean immediately after Returning to office in January, Lula moved to revive 
and strengthen regional institutions like uh, CELAC, UNASUR, and Mer Mercosur. Brazil's previous far-right president, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, had sought to sabotage these organizations, withdrawing or suspending the country's membership and instead aligning the South American giant closely to the United States, with the United States. I have to say, Bolsonaro, both Bolsonaro and Lula da Silva uh, have actually pretty good relationships with Russia. So I wouldn't say that Bolsonaro uh, was completely pro-US, although he was pro-US, don't get me wrong, but he still had a, a, a good relationship with President Vladimir Putin. And so did Lula da Silva. Lula da Silva is not some innocent bird himself, right? He, is, uh, he has close connections with the Democratic Party in the United States. Uh, obviously, him not sending weapons to Ukraine and, uh, sorry, to Germany, because he feared that these weapons would be used in the Ukraine to, you know, kill Russian soldiers and, and civilians and whatnot. Uh, as well as um, him breaking away from the dollar, from the dollar is will probably sever those connections to a large extent, right? Uh, let's see here. Um, Bolsonaro came to power thanks to two U.S.-backed political coups in Brazil, including a parliamentary putsch against Workers' Party President Dilma Rousseff in 2016 and the politically motivated imprisonment of Lula on false charges in the lead up to the 2018 election. Soon after entering office, Bolsonaro uh, traveled to Virginia to visit CIA headquarters, fearing legal consequences in Brazil for this flagrant corruption and for policies that caused the mass deaths of citizens. Bolsonaro fled to Florida two days before his term ended he has since been living in the United States as a, as a fugitive from justice. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening. Give this video a like, uh, subscribe to the channel, and share my content. Thank you very much.